Well, writing, how I started writing for young audiences is a little bit of a story, in as much as it absolutely wasn't planned. I had no intention of writing for young people or working with young people or having anything to do with young people, really. I trained as an actor and I was headed straight for the RSC in my head. And then, of course, I left drama school and the RSC didn't call. <laughs> or indeed, virtually everybody else, really. And after a while, I mean, ironically, actually, the very first job I got was in a children's musical, which only served to confirm to me how crap children's theatre could be, which I thought I knew. So that I thought, well, that's it. And then after I'd been out of work for a while, I got a call from the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. Now, I'd actually auditioned there for an adult show, but not got the job, but they'd seen me. And they said, would I like to go and do a play for six-year-olds in schools? Well, no, not really, but better than tearing tickets at the ICA, which is what I was doing. So I thought, yeah, I'll just go. It's only for six weeks, I'll do it. So I go there, and I suddenly find myself among, among a group of people who are, A, very good, it seemed to me. I mean, some people have got, like Linda Bassett, who've gone on to a kind of stellar career. And here, I suddenly found you could do both. You could do what you kind of wanted to do, and actually people seem to benefit from it. I also actually started to write when I was there, because once a year we did a main house show, a kind of family show, and that was not devised, but was written. But I wrote with other people. I never sat down and wrote, you know, on my own at a table or anything. I mean, the penny that dropped for me, I suppose, was that what excited me about work, any work in the theatre, wasn't ultimately where I was doing it. It was, it was the quality of the work. When I left for Belgrade in '85, I kind of thought, oh, I want to go back to acting. I've been distracted, you know, from my wonderful classical acting career. Well, in between my acting jobs, I got work at Rose Bruford's on their now defunct, but possibly in a way now resurrected course about community theatre arts. And I went and I both taught on that a little bit based on my experience at, at Belgrade. And I also devised and then scripted three plays for young audiences with their students. And then in 1989, when I kind of said, okay, do you know what, it's time for me to come out as a writer, stop all this kind of uh, acting nonsense, because it was I'm sure I wouldn't have said that if it was going really well, but it wasn't. Um, I said, I'm going to concentrate on writing. The people at the Crucible, who was at the time Phil Clark, who was head of theatre and education, said, oh, why don't you come here and be our writer in residence? And I was like, you are mad, you know, because I had never actually sat down on my own at a desk with a typewriter and written a play. I'd either devised or I'd written with other people. And he said, no, I'm not allowed to come. And I ended up writing a play for the Youth Theatre, which was, which was great. I'd never written for Youth Theatre before. What being at the Crucible did for me, I suppose it's true to say, is that if you have a title, any title, it's like when I was artistic director years later, suddenly, people will speak to you on the phone you've been trying to get hold of for years and suddenly you're a member of the club. And so I started to get commissions from other companies. Um, not a major thing, you know, the Solon People's Theatre, uh, the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff commissioned me to write and it sort of got me going and I got an agent while I was there. How did that influence or shape your craft as a writer? Let's put it like this. I think the audience is at the absolute centre of everything I do. Who, whoever that audience is. And my audiences are very different because even now I write for adults, I write for who oh, I basically write for whoever asked me to. Some of those plays are for adults, some are for older people in residential care. Basically, when people say, Who do you write for? I say, I write for specific community audiences. So they could be young children, they could be older children, they could be youth, a youth audience, whatever. But I always start from the audience. And if it's an audience I know, then, and you might say that's generally a kind of adult audience, then I don't have to do a lot of research. If it's an audience I don't know, like older people in residential care, or don't know very well, or perhaps haven't been around for a while, I'll go and spend some time there. I mean, I'm just about to write a play for two to four year olds, and I'm going to spend some time in, uh, you know, with a nursery group, just to be around the kids, just to kind of, clock in to check into where they are uh, in developmental terms. I mean, I know you can read this, but just to hear them talk, uh, see, uh, get what their references are, where, you know, what their worldview is, I know it sounds a bit wild, but, you know, just to be around them, really. So, 
I think the fact that I've written for, and I suppose it started off with young people, is that it's made me very aware of making my work accessible, by which I don't necessarily mean comfortable, but accessible for whatever audience I'm writing for. What are the differences that you have to consider, but also what are the universal writing truths across those audiences? Yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the thing about writing for different audiences, for me, is yeah. that there are differences, obviously, there are differences. I, I, I wouldn't write the same... I wouldn't write the same play for an audience of five-year-olds as I would for an audience of 15-year-olds. I just wouldn't. I might write a play about the same question. Mm -hmm. I, could use, I could start with the same question, yeah. uh, but I'd write it in different ways. And, you know, um, if I'm writing a play about relationships for five-year-olds, then it's going to be about friendship or familial relationships. It's not going to be based on the sexual relationship because that's not their experience. Equally, of course, you've got to look at all that all the questions of language and accessibility and references. What's the point in, in writing stuff that they uh, spend half the time working at or not knowing what it means? That's not to say I think everything... I, don't, I think sometimes it, it can be quite nice for them to have things they can find out about or wonder, it, or wonder about or, you know, I don't think everybody has to understand every moment of every play. I bloody well don't when I go to the theatre. There's loads of stuff I, I don't get. The big mistake to make is writing what you think they need, is coming at it from a sort of um, therapeutic point of view, saying, oh, I, I bet this will be good for you. And I, Now, I start from the point of view of, what, what do I want to write about? Who am I writing it for? How do I write a play which bridges that? So that I still can write about what I want to write about and they will get it. I mean, a good case in point, and that sounds like I, would, I always initiate the project, but of course I don't. A good case in point would be um, Tutti Fruity's Hair and Tortoise, which I wrote last year or the year before, whatever it was. And they came to me and said, oh, we'd like a, a version of the Aesop fable. And I was like, oh yes, it sounds like a nice idea, they're a nice company, and uh, that, that would be very good, thank you very much. Uh, and then I went away and thought, uh, I read the fable and I thought, I don't, I, don't, I don't really like this moral. It didn't strike me as true, absolutely. I wasn't sure I wanted to say to very young children, slow and steady. Was, it felt a bit, I don't know, I didn't, couldn't find the play I wanted to write about using that story and I didn't want to use that story. Um, and it took me ages to find a play that I wanted to write that I thought they would also want to see. And I think that's true for any audience for me. So those are my two things. I want to write it, and I want to write a play that you'll want to see. Um, that you might find challenging, but, but you'll enjoy, and you'll find stimulating, or moving, or funny. Because I write a lot, a lot of the stuff I write is kind of funny. Um, and, and that's always the two, it has to satisfy those two things. You know, I'm not saying there haven't been occasions when I've written something which I thought you want to see but I don't really want to write and I think they're probably my weakest pieces. When you were running Oxfordshire Touring Theatre Company yeah. um, and you probably got the responsibility of box office yeah, yeah, yeah. as well, how did that affect your what the finding the play you want to write? Was it I want to write this play to make lots of money or was No, it... no, well I wish we no we never made lots of money but uh, you see, I don't mind. Um, I don't mind constraints. In fact, I don't think I could write. If someone said, "Oh, you can write anything you want," blah blah blah, blah and I just don't know how to write it. I mean, basically, yes, you do have to think about box office because you you have to sell it. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And so, you were looking for titles, perhaps, and it's true to say, titles on the whole, which would sell and attract an audience. But what you would do then? is work with writers, and I include myself in this, who might be true to the story but still give them a few surprises, or in a different way. And we did a play called The Delicious Revenge of Princess Ruby Slippers, which was actually a reworking of a play I'd originally done for the Unicorn. It was probably our most successful Christmas show, in that it had something in it, and this is also perhaps a point of interest, where it had a character who people could relate to. So the parents all, of course, you know, I had one mum who said to me, have you been spying in my house? Because that's what it's like in the morning, you know, with these fights going on about what you're going to eat, blah, blah, blah. And, and the kids also related to the children. So you do think about your audience, and I, and I never felt, you know, I'm about to say the word compromise, which people say is a really negative... 
I just think it's about being pragmatic. What's the point of writing a play no one's going to come and see? I don't see the point of it. If, you're going to t- if they're going to turn off and stop listening, you're dead in the water, it seems yeah. to me. You know, and that applies to things like language. You know, if you're dealing with an audience who would be outraged at the word fuck, don't use the word fuck, for fuck's sake. You know, don't do it. You know, and when you're dealing with older people, they don't like very... I'm talking about quite frail older people. They don't like to... They don't want people having a row too much. It's about upsetting. So you've got to be careful about things like that. There are quite a number of plays you write, or one writes, or I write, especially at the street of my adult work, that get done once, maybe. My, my children's plays tend to get done more than once. And how high, how high is up, has been done... I, would, I suppose it must have been done 25, 30 times now. I've not seen them all, but I've seen a good many of them. And for the first 10 years of its existence, I think I saw them all. They were all being done around Britain. For me, it was really, really useful because I kept tinkering, I suppose, or refining the play. Every time I'd see a production, I'd be interested in the production, but I'd also have another chance to hear it being spoken by different voices and done in a different way. What I like about it, and this goes for any company that's done my work, is, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I didn't like that production. And I don't get quite so worked up about it as they do, because for me, I only get worked up about production if I don't think the people have honoured it or cared about it. Um, so I can not like something, but I'm still like cool about it. I think, oh, well, but they, but they gave it all they had. You talked about not being offensive, you know, not being offensive yeah. on stage, you know, for the, you know, in case audience. But I kind of go, uh, my, what came into my mind at that point was, oh, big baby, <laughs> big baby could be considered fairly offensive. Yeah. In a, but in an amusing. Humorous kind of a way. Yeah, Big Baby was uh, um, the second, no, third play I was commissioned to write by a theatre centre because I did How High Is Up, I did Under the Bed. We were two years into the Labour government and I was horribly, horribly disillusioned, you know, the whole education, education, education thing. And so we ended up writing the play. The first draft actually was all about setting the future, about um, a government who take very gifted children and develop them as a kind of resource that take them away from their parents and develop them into a kind of industry so that it's like dehumanised. Like everyone was getting very excited but I was losing faith in the play and um, I, I felt, I don't know, I just felt I was writing about, I was writing the, the whole future idea, I, I, I didn't feel right for me. And, and in the end I, did, I came up with a very radical different second draft. My second draft is set in the 18th century or rather begins in the 18th century. Because one of the questions that I asked myself was that, I, and, I, and I do this quite a lot, I'm quite practical, I go, okay, so if, let's say the story is about a baby that gets bigger and bigger. Why, why would you want your baby to get bigger and bigger? I mean, everyone wants their baby to grow. I mean, there comes a point where you don't want to grow anymore. You know, why would you want your baby to get big and big and big and big to the end? You know, um, I mean, what you wouldn't, would you? What does a baby produce? poo, actually, than sick, really. That's kind of what it produces. So you'd only get to get more of poo. What if the poo was somehow magic? Oh. So I was suddenly into a kind of slightly ascatological kind of vein, which was also 18th century, and also surreal. So I ended up with a story, actually, that was about a very kind of, and in fact they're called Janet and John, a very Janet and John um, simple country couple who have this baby who's just you know, just beautiful. I mean, who literally, you know, out of whose arse the sun literally shines. But they don't know what to do with it, so they gave it to, they put it into the hands of people who they believe can do better. And they, they kind of squashed the baby's natural genius until the baby could only produce poo. And, and then in order to cover their tracks, they start to market the poo. What happens is that the, the child goes on growing and is exploited, in a sense, by, by society, not by the parents. The parents have allowed it to happen, but with the best will in the world, trying to do the best with their child. And, and in the end, the, the, the father kills the, his own child, which is the most terrible, imaginable thing, I think. It was about education, and part because it was so full of scatological imagery and indeed action, not just imagery, 
that some of the audiences, and this goes to schools and indeed adults, because I did it later on for an adult tour when I was at Oxford, and we were at West Yorkshire Playhouse with it for a week, and we had, on the one hand, people who cancelled their subscription to the theatre on the back of it, which the theatre wrote to me about and said, what was I going to do about that? And I thought, well, I don't know. And equally, reaction from the audience that said, this is the best thing we've ever seen. And we've got the same sort of split with teachers. Some teachers were, thank God someone's saying this. This is, education shouldn't be about stuffing our children full of facts and measuring it and only being interested in what's measurable. And other teachers were a bit nervous about the whole thing. So I was just saying, I don't think you should be raising these questions with, with, with teenagers. It's a good example of what I was talking about earlier, which was a play I really wanted to write. It came from a place of anger, that one did, and a, and a play I thought I wanted the audience, which were both uh, teenagers and, and, and teachers, to, who would engage with it. Because it was, I was talking about what was happening on their, in their lives every day. But I would say really, really only write what you want to write, or what excises you, you know what I mean? What excites you and excises you, and, um, so don't, don't do what you think they should be getting. I, I just don't, I don't see the point. So I think you need to start from you. That's not wrong, that's right, I think. That's right for you as the artist. Don't start being, don't start being a teacher, and that's not to diss what teachers do, but that's a different job. But equally, know your audience, I think. Go and spend, if, you don't, if you're not a parent or you, you're not around children generally, go and spend some time observing or go and go watch other, other plays for young people and see what's out there. And, but know your audience and be true to yours, you know, cheat yourself, be true.